Okay, my name is Marco Keba, and I'm here with Joseph Perrin at the Ericsson Agile 2012 China Conference. Hi, everybody. And uh, Joseph is a social complexity and XP expert. So maybe just for the people that uh, do not know enough about you, just maybe in a few words, can you describe where you come from? Where I come from? Yeah. I'm Swiss. I come from Switzerland. We invented mountains and cheese and chocolate and uh, skiing and ways to launder all your money. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we want to keep that on here, but uh, in any case, yes, I'm from Switzerland. Okay. And more of a professional background where you're coming from? And professionally, I was born in the United States and I grew up there. I studied philosophy and psychology and <coughs> now work in the field of social complexity and I've been involved in computing and software development for a number of years since the mid-1980s. That was back working first in artificial intelligence where I learned the programming language small talk and I first met people like Ward Cunningham and Kent Beck and I worked as Kent Beck's assistant in the late 90s helping to invent something which you might know as extreme programming. I was the first certified scrum master and practitioner and trainer in Europe and I tend to work more at a management level now trying to get whole companies to be agile instead of just software development teams. Okay. <coughs> okay, so in the conference you gave uh, two speeches and one was about Kinevin and making a uh, sense of agile in a, in a different maybe perspective mm -hmm. now and the other one was about uh, teams and how do teams self organize So maybe to start the whole discussion of what do you say defines a team? That is a difficult question and what I would suggest doing is turning the question around <coughs> and saying depending on how you define a team it will consist of different people with different skill sets and it will act differently. So the value set saying what you define, what you think is important in a team will define the way a group then becomes a team and who's in the team and who's not. Okay. Do you understand uh, yeah. turning yeah. things around? Okay. So yeah. I have no one definition and I get a, I'm away from the systems thinking idea that a team is defined and self organizes around a common goal and things like that. That was good for 1980s management books, but uh, research and science has passed on s since then. Okay, actually in the presentation what you said is that great individuals don't necessarily make a great team. Why is that? Um, well, we see that happen a lot, not only in software development. I think the greatest example was the Italian national football team at the last World Football Championships where you get the best football players in Italy and they get thrown out in the first round. Why does this happen? This happens because certain things are missing which would cause people to change their behavior patterns and act like a team. So what they have is something which in complexity theory we call self-assembly and not self-organization. There's something missing to cause them to change, so they revert to their old behavior patterns, which are very alpha male and very aggressive. Okay. And it's a, it's a problem of their egos. There's nothing that happens that causes them to reduce or change their egos and working as a member of the team. Okay, so we need to, sort of an igniter or something yeah. that is... Uh, yes. Okay, so, so if we want a team, we have a group of, <coughs> of, of individuals and we want them to form a team and we want them uh, to self-organize basically, how we make the induction, how we spark? Well, this happens anyway. The best thing to do, I say, is to just leave them alone. Self-organization happens anyway. That's the first thing to understand that if you're going to come in and try to change things, do it homeopathically, coax them along, don't push them. And secondly, understand that it's not only the team. There are no self-organizing teams. The self that organizes is a complete system which consists of the team and things around and people around it. Okay, the environment of the team. Yeah. Yes, exactly. The idea is that 
And it comes from social psychology, is that the behavior of a person, <clears throat> or also the behavior of a group of people, is dependent on the people and their environment. We see this in the Agile Manifesto where they talk about individuals and interactions. So what we do is we interact with our environment and that interacts with us. The environment that we have changes the way we work. The chairs we're sitting in, the desks we have, our continuous integration environment changes the way we work. The reporting tools that we might have to use change the way we work. We, on the other hand, can change our environment. We can change our desks. We can change our development environment. We can change these things. There's a constant interaction between both of them. And if all you look at is the team, then you're making a big mistake. Then things happen and you don't understand why. If you look at it in the context of the system, then bigger things happen in the system as a result of the team and its environment interacting. Does it, that, does that mean that the people around the team that are not actually producing the value for the customers are there to set the environment in the way that it helps the people in the team bring yeah. the best value? This <coughs> This can be the role of an external coach, is to set up the environment so that people have to react to it. So a way to help people work better, act in an environment, or also set it up as far as to have people have to react to a new environment. And it's a very soft way of getting people to do things without telling them what to do. It's also a way of pushing them to go in a certain direction. How close would that be to the role of a manager in, a, in an agile organization? For me, it's a possible role of a manager, a good manager. <coughs> Unfortunately, there are too, many, too few of them who understand this part of science. But good managers often tend to do this intuitively, to ask, what can I do to set up the conditions so that good things will naturally happen? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay. As, as somehow Scrum has ended up as the most used framework of all the, of the, mm -hmm. the, the Agile uh, methods, is, uh, I mean, it, it seems so easy that, you know, it's just three roles, three ceremonies, yes. three artifacts. Easy to explain, but mm -hmm. hard to use. And why is that? Why is Scrum so hard to do right? Is that, why should that be surprising? There's a big difference, <coughs> excuse me, there's a big difference between knowledge and skills. Do you play chess? Yes. Okay. How long does it take to teach somebody the rules of chess? An hour? Yeah, not too long. Not too long. How long does it become, take to become a grandmaster? Sometimes never. For many of us, never. Learning the rules of chess is learning the knowledge. Learning the fact that Scrum has three meetings and three roles is knowledge. Learning the skills to do this at a grandmaster level is a totally different thing. There are three things you need to do to gain skills. First, you take lessons. Think of it also as a, as a musician or as a chess player. You go and you take lessons. You work with an expert. You work with a teacher, a trainer, somebody who knows not only how to play the game, but how to teach people to get better. And you take more than one lesson. A two-day Scrum Master course will never help. It will only be the first step. Secondly, you learn to analyze, you learn to understand why to, do, sorry, why to do things in certain situations, why to do things in other situations, and when to do what. And that's important to understand that if you look at, at famous chess games, maybe with the same situation on the board, the same player against two different opponents will make a different move. Although, by the first time, if he won the first time making a move, he'd be stupid to make a different move. So why does he do it, even if he wins the second time? Understanding the situational part is very important. Third thing you need to do is practice. A lot, a lot, a lot of practice. You know, psychologists say you need to practice something 10,000 hours to become an expert in it. I think you probably need less time to become a good scrum master or a good scrum team member. But still, you need a lot of practice. One thing you need to remember while practicing Something my guitar teacher told me when I was young. He said, Joseph, if you make a mistake and don't correct it immediately, you practice playing mistakes. Then when you get up on the stage to play a concert, you'll be really good at playing mistakes. But that's not how you get the chicks. <laughs>
Okay, so it's harder to to learn do a skill right. than just yeah. to learn the knowledge. Yeah. That's probably an easy thing. Yeah. Skill is theoretical book thinking. Sorry, mm -hmm. knowledge is theoretical book thinking. Skill is real world where all of a sudden you're confronted with things that haven't been covered in a book. Yeah. Okay. And we see that for Scrum to work right and for people to, to, to actually get all the benefits of Agile, uh, we need to somehow use some technical practices in, in, into the team, into the way that they produce software. Mm -hmm. And we see that XP is all about the practices yeah. and Scrum is all about the framework, how to organize, so to yeah. say. How do, we, how do we get the team? <coughs> well, that's not the only the thing you need to introduce. Scrum, the interesting thing about Scrum is Scrum doesn't tell you what to build. If your marketing analysis is not good, with Scrum you're guaranteed to build the wrong thing. And then the rest of the world, the market, will kill you for that. And you saw that with that Finnish telephone company. So it doesn't tell you what to build. On the other side, it doesn't tell you how to build it. Scrum is domain independent. You can use it for many things outside of software development. But as you rightly say, if you're developing software and your technical practices aren't good with Scrum, you're guaranteed every two weeks to build bad software. At least with this two-week iteration, you hopefully see it and do something about it before the market punishes you for it. Right? <laughs> so there's some meat in the middle of this sandwich, and that's what Scrum is about. Scrum is about asking the question, when do we do what? in a complex situation. So that's how it fits in. You need <coughs> agile, well, good marketing analysis is agile. Good marketing analysis tracks movements of the market really quickly. The problem we have is getting that over some rigid waterfall requirements process even into development. And that's where a lot of companies really have problems. Making this requirements process agile under the constraints of a company that essentially is still waterfall. Mm -hmm. So, on the technical side, the best way to start doing XP is just to introduce Scrum, because Scrum done properly will increase transparency about the problems that you have with technical practices. Mm -hmm. my, my friend Steve Freeman, one of the old extreme programming uh, first gurus, called, says Scrum is the revenge of XP. If you do Scrum right, it'll show you that you need these technical practices. And you do the technical practices in order to solve the problems that Scrum is showing you. That's why you don't say we just do pair programming so that we do pair programming. No, we do pair programming because we have a problem with knowledge transfer, we have a problem with quality. We do continuation, not be continuous integration, not because we do continuous integration, but we do it because we need to provide something for our customers all the time. So by answering those questions that Scrum brings up, remember Scrum, Scrum is a diagnostic tool. Scrum tells you very quickly where all your problems are, and it really hurts. So sometimes people just change Scrum so it doesn't hurt so much. The thing, they lose all the advantages of Scrum by doing that. The problems that Scrum bring up though are normally not problems of Scrum. They're normally problems of political power plays, psychological stuff, all this stuff, HR problems, or they're technical problems. But it was stuff that was there before. Yeah. So these are problems that, that were there already. Scrum has just made them so transparent that you can't avoid them. So take advantage of that lesson. Scrum will tell you where to start. And then you do XP things as a way to solve those problems. So don't do Scrum for itself and don't do XP for itself. Do it as a way to solve these other problems that, it sh that have been shown to you. Okay. And there is a lot of talk about you know, the skills that a Scrum Master should have, maybe a manager. There is a lot of talk on, on, on that, yeah. that skill set, so to say. But there is not that much talk about the skill set of a team member, so mm -hmm. to say, that are not technically related as we were just speaking. Yeah. So what would the new soft skill set of a team member needs to be for the team to actually properly self-organize? Um, well, besides facts of you know, personal hygiene and, and stuff like that, being able to work together with people, I think one of the advantages of agile software development <coughs> is the realization that people do software development and that software development is a team sport. 
agile development doesn't have place for the lonely cowboy anymore. So it's made people aware that you have to be able to work together. And unfortunately, the problem is that a lot of software developers are lacking in social skills. So I wouldn't rec recommend uh, speed dating or going to dating sites or something like that, although that's probably a good idea. But um, would recommend things like some training in communication. Some, some basic techniques of, of communicating, of working with each other. And I have a friend of mine who just finished her doctorate in London at the university who did research on pair programming. Because pair programming is something that everybody thinks that they can do. And she found out, no, that's a social skill, like dancing or something like that, and you need to learn how to do it. So that would be another thing. And I'm curious to hear from her what her latest theories are about how to start learning how to do it. Okay, so it's not straightforward, so to say, that yeah. uh, you know, even for pair, fair programming, it's not yeah. straightforward saying, you know. I mean, what's the best way to do it? This is what, once again, it's a psychological process and you have to deal with individuals, right? <clears throat> but once again, individuals and their interactions. Getting okay. back to that. Okay. So what each individual needs and the best way to deal with that for each individual is an individual thing then. Okay. Uh, now, maybe switching to Kinevin, as this was uh, your second presentation, you say you tried to explain how we can make sense of Agile. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, talking about the, the model of Kinevin, would we say that software development, in its essence, is a simple, complicated, complex, or a chaotic thing or environment? Yes. All of the above. <laughs> all of the above. <laughs> this is actually one of the, the problems is that uh, it's always been said by agile people, like Ken Schraber especially says, oh, software development is complex. And everybody believes, ended up believing that. My research shows me that it's all of the above. There are things we do that are simple. There are things we do that are complicated. There are things that we do that are complex, and there are things we do that are chaotic, or there are things we do that we're not quite sure yet. Running a test is simple. Putting together a distributed build process is complicated. Right? Uh, dealing with user requirements and prioritization may be a complex thing because there are a number of people you have to involve in that and juggling that. And <clears throat> finding out how to fix a bug that comes in that has just crashed your system, maybe a chaotic crisis intervention. And also, it's fractal, it's self-similar, that any one of these things we're doing may in itself, as a system, have elements that are simple, complicated, complex, and chaotic. Okay. So there, at many different levels of resolution, we have a self-similar fractal system. So the way that we want to do it is we want to shift stuff out of the areas that we have little influence on. <clears throat> that is one possible way of doing it. I think the best way is to understand the process of sense making, understand what it is that we're doing and where it fits in, and then understand which tools do we have, what tools do we have for something that's simple. Simple, that means it's understandable, it's repeatable. Automate that. Automate your testing. Right? How do you go about dealing with complicated things? How do you go about dealing with complex things? Well, complex, if you can't predict the future, what you want to do is go one step at a time and make sure after every step or every couple of steps that you check if you're going in the, the right direction. And this thing, which is what we call probe, sense, respond, try to find out what's the best way to go someplace, try it, take a look at your results, and react to that. That's the same as apply, inspect, and adapt. And that's one of the reasons why a framework like Scrum is very good for dealing with any type of complex work. It says, <clears throat> let's go in this direction, let's get the empirical evidence, let's see if what we're doing is going to help our situation or not. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Joseph. Maybe to end the whole interview up, uh, would there be some sort of a, a, a tip for the Ericsson Agile community or the young Croatian yes. Agile community? Yes. Question everything. Just because we do it, we all bald-headed old farts do it, doesn't mean you should just do it automatically. Yeah, we have some more experience, but we only got where we were by questioning these things before. 
extreme programming only came about because Kent Beck questioned whether the waterfall was the best way to do it. So question everything. Don't believe what people tell you. That's a dangerous thing to say, and I think I'd better shut up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan.